Charting Toward Intimacy covers mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Charting Toward Intimacy covers mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to Charting Toward Intimacy, where we're expanding the natural family planning conversation. I'm your host, Ellen Holloway. All right, we are here with Brittany Pearson, um, and we're going to be talking about the pelvic floor today, which I'm so excited to talk about. Brittany, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Ellen. I am super excited to talk about this with you today. <laughs> we were already, before we hit record, we were already like chatting a bunch about it, and I was like, uh, all of this chat should be probably on the recordings. So. <laughs> for sure. Super so. relevant. Um, before we jump in, could you introduce yourself to our listeners? Sure, definitely. So I am a Catholic wife and mom of three boys. Uh, it's interesting cause I am from a family of all girls. I was one of four girls. So now I'm trying to figure out what boy mom life is like, but so far so good. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, they are four, two and six months old. And, um, I, for years worked in person as a personal trainer and actually met my husband that way at the gym, we were both personal trainers and we, uh, I, since then having my first child took everything pretty much online, had a hand a little bit in both worlds, still training a couple people at the gym and working that out back and forth. And now pretty much in the online space, but I very much enjoy working with women who are in that about to be mom stage of life in between baby stage of life kind of thing. I noticed a big need for that in especially the Catholic world, because I think that sometimes seeking exercise advice for yourself or whatever it is can be seen as extra, something you don't need to do. There's a lot of different ways you can look at taking care of yourself. And I've seen, you know, it to excess in commercial gyms where it's like, I want to be this percent body fat. And like, that's the only thing I'm focused on in life. Right. (laughs) Exactly. I've seen that extreme. And then I've also seen the mom of eight kids. Who's like, I've never once thought about, you know, what would be healthy for my pelvic floor, for my core, like keeping myself healthy and strong. And instead they're dealing with a lot of ailments. So I was just kind of encountering that naturally when I, um, stepped out of the gyms and more into spaces where I was in person with a a much different clientele who was like complete, all of this was completely new to them. And in general, it was because it was brought to their attention from pain or from problems. So I'm like, you know, this is very necessary, very needed. So I uh, started specializing more, got my certification in pre and postnatal and really enjoy that aspect too. But I still do help women um, really in all walks of life. I still work with some women who are 60 coming to me saying, you know, I never got strong before. What can we do now? And all of that stuff. So I love it. I love anything health and fitness super fun because my husband is also a revert and I have a master's (laughs) in theology. So we like our dinner conversations are either like about squat depth or about like angelology. You just have no idea where it's going. Or maybe both in the same uh, meal. That's fantastic. Usually, usually. (laughs) Oh my gosh. I love that. And I totally agree. I think that's a space that is, um, is lacking, um, in just, you know, in, in my personal experience, like all I had was the postpartum doctor's appointment where it was like, oh yeah, yeah, you could start exercising again. But I, I remember actually feeling kind of like lost of like, can I still exercise at the same level? Should I be doing right. different things? Should I, anyway, that's not the topic of this podcast, which we totally could talk about that in another one. Um, but yeah, I love that you are filling that need. Um, okay. So we are talking pelvic floor today. Yes. Um, and as I said, before we started recording this, I know about, if you take your, um, your index finger and your thumb and put them, put them really, really, really close together. That's how much I know about the pelvic floor. It's <laughs> good visual. I got it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> I know on, on uh, podcasts, you can't like show my little pinching fingers. So Brittany, what is the pelvic floor? <laughs> Yeah. And I am just here to tell you that is like majority of women. So it is not, thank and goodness I, I'm not alone. <laughs> yeah. And I think hearing that, and then some of the things that we'll talk about with it, that it can seem so taboo or with a lot of topics I know that you talk about on the podcast too, probably like embarrassing or shameful and stuff. And it's not, it's just not, 
really talked about and it should be. I also think there's a big push for like awareness of everything. It's like normalize this. You're like, okay, we also don't have to talk about everything. But in this case, like in women's health, I do think this is a little bit lacking. And I do wish it was um, something that is brought up in your, you know, check-in doctor appointment and things like that. It's usually not there. It's usually a gap between what you're going to talk about with your OB and uh, going to a pelvic floor therapist or trainer specialized in that. So firstly, the pelvic floor is basically without getting, you know, super into the anatomy and all of the muscle terms, there's basically three big muscles that compose the pelvic floor and more specifically three muscle slings, the anterior, the front, the middle, and the posterior, the back. But what slings are, is it's just a compilation of soft tissues, muscle fascia, ligaments in there. So there's a lot that composes the pelvic floor that again, if you want to get real anatomy wise, you can look up all of the terms and everything. (laughs) But what I think is most important for most of us to know, which is how my husband and I work because he's like the term guy. And I'm like, no, no, no. Just tell the ladies what they want to hear. Like tell them how they can get that result. We don't care. (laughs) Usually we don't care that much. So, um, but what it is, how I think of it and what makes sense to me visually is kind of like a hammock between all of your pelvic floor organs and then the perennial region. Hmm. So it's super important because if you think about that, like, yeah, oh yeah. What is holding all that up? Like, why did I not think about that before? And obviously all of that is having a toll taken on it during pregnancy when things are shifting around and moving and expanding. So the, what is important? So you can kind of visualize where it is in your body, but it's responsible for a lot. So continence is something it's responsible for. Um, a big way that the pelvic floor even comes to most women's attention is when they're like, oh, I had a baby and now I pee when I sneeze or, oh, I can't jump anymore. And a lot of things that I've heard of, is just really normal. Like that's normalized and shouldn't be, which we'll talk talk about about that all the time. And like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I don't want to jump into a tangent here. No, go for it. (laughs) I'm all about, I'll follow you down the rabbit hole. Circle back. It's. (laughs) I was just going to say that it's, it's really interesting because my experience in my doctor's appointments is I haven't been, uh, I, I have never had the pelvic floor mentioned to me. However, I do recall that there is a poster in my doctor's office that says, do you pee when you sneeze? And ah. there's like a support group. So I guess the pelvic floor is kind of in my doctor's appointment. I really hope the support group is like helping to rectify that. Not I just hope like- so. Yeah. We all pee when we sneeze. (laughs) Not just sitting around going, yeah, this sucks. (laughs) Yeah. Again, a a normalized thing. Um, no, it's, that's one of the ways that it, it, you know, this, like a symptom of pelvic floor issues, but yeah, it also contributes to, um, back health and back pain. A lot of times Mm. people just focus on the core, but the pelvic floor actually works very closely together with your core muscles. It's all related. You can't, relax or contract the pelvic floor fully without involving your abs. So it it all goes together. And it's something that we, again, tend to leave out. Same thing with breathing. It helps you get full breaths and stop um, straining your core so much. And then also it, because this relates to probably most people listening to this podcast, right. Who are charting and whatnot, and that it helps you have stronger orgasm as well and enjoy sex more when those muscles are properly healthy. So, and we'll, we'll probably talk about that, that it can be tight. You can be weak. You know, it's, it's helpful to think about the pelvic floor though, as any other group of muscles in the body, mm-hmm. right. You would strengthen them. You would, or, and if you're having a problem, it will show itself, but you want them, you don't want anything super tight and you don't want anything super weak either. So it's just right. another like you don't group want your of shoulders muscles. to be super tight because then you're going to like have an uncomfortable day. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. So, um, so why is it, or sorry, that's not the question I wanted to ask you. It's okay. Um, so tell me more about what the pelvic floor has to do with my sex life. Sure. Sure. So your pelvic floor muscles, if you cannot, I think it might be helpful to talk a little bit about, um, them being weak or yeah. Okay. Strong let's, first to kind of let's go through do that. that first. Yeah, sure. So if you are, if you have super strong pelvic muscles, which first of all, I would say optimally, because if you're listening to this podcast, like, well, how the heck am I ever going to 
be able to figure this out. What am <laughs> yeah. I going to do with this information? I hate listening to something and walking away like awesome, but now I'm more stressed out because I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do. So right. ignorance was bliss before. And now you've told me all this stuff. <laughs> seriously. Like what if this is happening? So if you, you know, and I'm right there with it. I have an amazing Catholic OB who is never like, who's like, awesome. NFP, you're good. Like which method do you use? Okay, great. But I still have not had anybody talk about my pelvic floor. They'll check. Um, I did at my third birth. So I've had three babies at the third check-in. They did check about um, diastasis recti, the separation of the abs. And I was very happy to see that because you don't usually get that either. So say you leave your six week, whatever, 12 week, and you have no idea where your pelvic floor is at. The first thing, the best thing you could do is go to a physical therapist that specializes in this. However, and this is where I work with a lot of the women who are option two, who can't make it there. And I understand that my husband works crazy hours. I'm the primary caregiver for the three. It's hard to, you go to a physical therapist once, then you're like, oh, now I have to come back three times a week. Like this is not going to happen. So the next best thing that you could do is to get with someone you really trust whatever way you can. Maybe it's a program following, um, for pelvic floor healing, but it's essential to know whether you are tight or weak. So if you are, and so your physical therapist can tell you that, but then if you get with a personal trainer who specializes in pre and postnatal two, they should be able to tell you this as well, but to kind of self-diagnose it, if like level three, that's where you're at. Like, I just want to figure out where I'm at myself, hypertonic thinking like hyper overactive, right? Hypertonic is your way too tight. And this is actually really common after childbirth, where I think the stigma, if anything would be, oh, I probably have a weak pelvic floor. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think we hear that all like, oh, it's probably stretched out. It's probably whatever, but you can actually like a lot of it is how you are healing as well. I think, and there's not a lot of research to back this up, but from the women that I've worked with, I think a lot does play in with temperament and like personality. I know for me, I'm very type A. I'm very like my leaning is not to be really open and Lucy and go with the flow. And my body is like that, like in childbirth and everything, my issue is not pushing. My issue is dilating. And I think it's very, I I found across the board. My gosh, you're kind of blowing my mind right now because like, that's my personality type too. And that's, yeah, that's my, like, that's my problem in childbirth. My problem is not pushing. Right. And you you see how like the, everything works together. We can't separate these things of like, well, this is the this is how I am in childbirth. This is how I am. This like your whole person. And this is all going to factor in. Right. Wow. Yeah. I would like some research done on that. Like, oh my gosh. Yeah. I know just from my little pool, I'm like doing my low key on the side anecdotal right. notes, but <laughs> well, but that's yes. how research starts. I mean, <laughs> this is true beginning stages. So if you, if you are hypertension, then you well may be, cause this is the side I lean to. You might have difficulty starting to pee. You might have constipation. You might, this is a big one. And the big red flag for a lot of women is pain with penetration. And a lot of times that can just be thrown in the box of, oh, I know, you know, sex after childbirth is probably gonna be painful. Okay. We all know it might be a little uncomfortable the first couple of times. However, if you're frequently having pain with penetration, you might either just be really tight or you might even have prolapse, which I'll talk about in a second, which 50% of women do. And it's not again, like, oh my gosh, I better not have that. A lot of, think about that, like two women standing there, one probably does. So very, very common, but what can we do about it? So again, under hyper, these are things you would want to think about. Like, do I have difficulty starting to pee? Another one would be, do I get UTIs frequently? This Mm -hmm. I don't really fall under, but sometimes due to retention, like having the difficulty starting to pee, you're holding it in longer and you're more at risk for UTIs, but also that feeling of never being fully relaxed, which you know, you might think of again with other muscles, like, Oh, does your jaw always feel clenched? Are your shoulders always up to your ears? Like, do you catch yourself clenching your glutes? That was a big one for me in indicating while my pelvic floor is way too tight, because just when I'm standing there, and especially if I'm holding a baby, I, my butt is always squeezed. My glutes are always engaged. And I'm like, pretty relax. And I have to like (laughs) breathe it out (laughs) seriously. And I, I will think they're relaxed and they're still not. And I am very like bodily aware. So, um, it's interesting. So that's the, if it's way too strong. And then if it's underactive, this is typically where it is almost, you, you will feel like things are too loose. Like if you use tampons, tampons fault would fall out, or you could have trouble getting them to stay in. That's, um, a, one of the ways that a lot of women find out that they have issues is because they're like, why is this happening? Like this didn't happen before. 
or um, just sex doesn't feel like it used to before kids. The thing is, there is one crossover for both, which is that what we talked about where if you have some leakage when you are sneezing or coughing or jumping, also trouble controlling gas because your pelvic floor muscles, again, are front to back. Like it's not just contracting the front, but also the back. So sometimes you can have, you know, exactly what it sounds like trouble controlling gas because those muscles aren't firing. They're too weak, Mm -hmm. but, or, or they're too tight. So interesting, very, very important for your sex life, because even if you have just any of those symptoms, you can think about how that would affect in the bedroom, whether or not you have pain with penetration. Like if you're worried about trouble controlling gas or like you can't relax or things like that, it's going to directly affect that. And then prolapse is when your pelvic floor organs are actually falling out either the vaginal cavity or the rectum. And that is what I, when I was first starting to get certified in all of this, like absolutely opened my eyes to 50% of women, according to most studies have this and have no idea. So you could literally be having your organs descending on you and you have no idea, which is why. And then you find out when you're digging further, this is why a lot of women, a couple of kids down the road have surgery to correct this, to get everything kind of lifted back up. And this is why, but it can be super worked on without surgery, very preventative measures. Wow. Oh my yeah. gosh. That's insane. That's insane. That 50% of women like likely have this and it's not typically addressed say in the like six week postpartum checkup. That's crazy to me. Yeah. Yeah, oh for sure. Gosh. Okay. So there are I, things you can do though. There okay. Are things you can do. Well, then let's <laughs> talk about that. What can we do? So again, preventative and before surgery and most of these, um, not issues, I guess it, most of the issues present themselves more after childbirth, but also you could have either of these present before childbirth as well. So again, before surgery, before anything else, um, it's really helpful to know first I kind of self-diagnose what you think you are. If you fall under the too tight or too loose, and if you are too tight, then you're going to want, actually I should start with two weeks. Cause I'll explain the first thing, <laughs> the first exercise you can do. It'll make more sense. If you are typically too weak in the pelvic floor. So you're, you are not really feeling like things felt before you might feel like it's looser tampons are falling out, that kind of thing. You can do Kegels and you may have heard of Kegels before, but this is about as far as I'd ever heard the pelvic floor mentioned before was, Oh yeah, just do Kegels and you're good. So for those that don't know, Kegels are basically little contractions of the pelvic floor. But when you do them, you want to think about front to back, because a lot of people think like, okay, does that feel like I'm just kind of squeezing my vagina muscles? Does it feel like I'm like closing my butt? Like, what does it feel like? It should feel like you are literally opening and closing the opening of your vagina. That's what it should feel like. And you're trying to recruit both front and back. So actually what's usually best for most people, because a lot of people will hold it for a long time. They're like, oh yeah, I'll do it when I'm sitting in the car or whatever. I'll like hold it through a red light. But usually these kind of muscles need more of your short bursts of Mm. being able to do this. So, you know, there's fast twitch muscle fibers and there's slow twitch and in the pelvic floor, it's best to work them more. You want them to be able to fire up really intensely and then relax. So you're not really looking for holding it all day long and then letting it go. So um, when you're doing a Kegel, it's great to start with little 10 second holds, doing 10 of those in a row, like holding for 10 seconds. We're probably both doing them right now. Relax. Yeah, I know. I feel like everyone listening is like, okay, right. One, two, three. Three. Yeah. <laughs> and now with that, cause it's very hard. I think the easiest way to do this is by laying on your back the first couple of times you're doing it so that you can think about your pelvic floor muscles coming to the party as well. That it's not just, okay, I'm feeling my like vaginal muscles open and close, but that what I talked about is pelvic floor. If you can visualize that those deep like in your core kind of muscles lifting, like coming towards your belly button, easiest to think about when you're laying on the floor. That's what you want to think is you're inhaling and you're literally lifting those pelvic floor muscles and then a full exhale, getting them to relax. So that is great. If you are underactive, if you are weak, if you are too tight, like you and I might veer toward, you don't want to do Kegels, which is why you can't just across the board say, Oh, I have pelvic floor issues. I'll do Kegels. Mm. If you're already too tight, that's not going to help anything. That's, you know, actually compounding the problem. So what you want to focus on then is the full relaxation. So you can start in a Kegel if that helps you to think of them contracting, 
but then we're going for getting everything to totally relax. And usually what I would have women do instead is to focus more on passive stretching where you're breathing really deeply into those muscles, like lying on your back and, um, opening your legs and grabbing. If you have the flexibility to do so like grabbing your big toes with your hands so that your legs are up in the air, um, in yoga be referred to as happy baby, but you can also do it by putting your feet on a wall. So your feet are flat on the wall and you're lying on your back and your knees are bent and Mm -hmm. just breathing deeply into that. Cause it's going to help your pelvic floor kind of calm down. And then in general life, just be really aware of what you're doing. And this is what I try to talk about with clients is like, okay, but what are you doing when you're yes, exercising, but exercising might be 20 minutes of your day. Think about the rest of your day. Like I was talking about with my glute clenching, me standing at the kitchen sink, doing dishes and hyper squeezing my glutes all day is putting pressure on my pelvic floor. I need to relax that. So paying attention to what you're doing, not bearing down. Um, the only time in life you really should be bearing down is when you're literally pushing in delivery. Otherwise you, you should not feel that sensation. You should not be doing that when you're using the bathroom. You know, that is a very common thing that it's like, oh, you pick up something heavy and you like bear down. No, that's where you should be able to relax your pelvic floor, <laughs> let your core and your other muscles take the brunt. But a lot of women, and that's where a lot of stigmas come from. Like, oh, you shouldn't lift anything over 10 pounds or like, oh, don't lift that. My grandma used to say your uterus is going to fall out. I was like, what in the heavens are you talking oh about? Gosh. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh, that makes sense because all of them had to have lifts. Like a lot yeah. of the generation, because it was like, they weren't you know, lifting weights, which is a whole nother thing, but lifting weights was not really talked about for women and wasn't really done. It wasn't seen as feminine or anything. If anything, men were usually so like a lot of the times their core and their back and stuff wasn't strong enough. And they would bear down to like pick up groceries or pick up kids. Like our lives are very physical. So, um, yeah, not bearing down is a great place to start. And then assessing yeah. whether or not you need the Kegels or the relaxation. Oh my gosh. Wow. That's a great, I feel like that's a really great starting point because, um, yeah. You know, five minutes ago before you said all that, I was like, Oh my gosh, what do I do? <laughs> okay. Good. Good. Gave you uh, something hopefully tactical. Yes. Yeah. That was really helpful. So, um, I, what I'm wondering now is if you could just kind of, you mentioned it at the beginning, but just kind of talk back through kind of what somebody would do if they've sort of self-assessed themselves during this podcast, they're listening and they're like, wow, I think my pelvic floor is really tight. Or I think my pelvic floor is really loose. What is the best next couple of steps for them? Yeah, I think being very, once you know which route to go, like you said, you've self-assessed it and you know, being consistent with working on rectifying it, right? So that might look like getting a program that you know is either focused on if you are too tight or if you are too loose or working with someone one-on-one, definitely going to a physical therapist in person is going to give you the best picture because that even if um, a lot of times you can just go, this is what I like to do after delivery is just book one appointment with a pelvic floor specialist and say, can you just let me know which I am? Sometimes it does get to the point where some people are so tight. They literally cannot relax unless they have it manually done by a physical therapist. Mm, interesting. So, you know, that is a route that you can go and, um, or if prolapse is so bad that you just really want to get in there and in person, they have tools that where you can, you know, actually know if you are contracting and releasing and things like that, because it can be hard to tell. There's actually a lot. I have not tried any of those things, uh, but <laughs> I've gotten sent a lot of requests of ads and things like that, where you can like some insert something like a tampon and it can t- tell you if you are contracting or not. Um, because some of us are just so out of touch with those muscles, or if they are so weak, we can't feel them engage, things like that. But for the general population, for most people listening who, again, you've figured out, okay, I'm too loose or too tight. Take one of those routes. Think, okay, if I'm way too tight, I need the more stretching in there. I'm going to do what Brittany said, and I'm going to put my feet up on the wall and I'm going to do that stretch and really focus on my breathing three times a week for 10 minutes. That's a great thing. And that should really be the like silver lining of this is that the pelvic floor doesn't take much attention. Like it just needs a little bit of your time, which is great. Because I think if we told women, like now you do have to go to physical therapy three times a week, or you need to do this for an hour, whatever. It's so simple. Um, I try to do these things because I do, you know, try to get back developing my core and things like that after, after childbirth that I will just do them as a little warm up. I'll do two minutes of pelvic floor things, a couple minutes of core rebuilding. That's it. 10 minutes, the first, you know, several months after I've had a baby, but whatever 
you know, spot women are at listening to this, because if you've never paid attention to it, I'll have somebody, you know, who wants to work with me six, they're six months postpartum, but we start with this stuff. We start with pelvic floor and then gentle core rebuilding because you need it all. If you go right to, this is another thing. When they clear you at your appointment, people are like, you're free to work out. And then women are like, okay, I'll hop back on the treadmill or I'll do the same thing I did when I was pregnant or prior to pregnancy. And a lot of times that's going to put more pressure on your pelvic floor. Then you even, you know, you might not even have that much damage from pregnancy or from delivery, but now you're putting too much on it. Like if you try to lift, put press overhead to 20 pound dumbbells, what's taking the brunt of that? If your core is still jelly and your pelvic floor, you have no idea where it's at. Like it's going to cause a lot more lower damage. So it's best to start from the bottom, work your way up, start with pelvic floor again, couple minutes a day. If you are too loose, start working those 10 by 10 Kegels, couple minutes a day. That's all it takes. And then you can, you know, if you are too tight, work on the more stretching relaxation things, and then you can incorporate, um, strength training and things back into that core rebuilding. And it all does work together. If your core is strong, pelvic floor is usually going to be strong and whatnot. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Cause it's because it's so close and so connected, yeah. um, that like, as you, as you work those different areas, um, it makes a lot of sense. Awesome. That was really great. Um, is there anything else that you want to share before we kind of wrap up this episode? I think since we touched a little bit on it, And especially in regards to the pelvic floor and its relationship to, you know, your sex life and possible pleasure and things like that. Um, Another thing very closely related, since all this is so related that I would tell women to do is to incorporate strength trainings. So whether or not you work out, usually you work out when pregnant or you don't work out when pregnant, just specifically resistance training. There are so many studies, again, linking increased testosterone, which is going to boost your sex drive, make A lot of times it's just, it comes up when working with women in this sphere and in this phase of life where you're having babies, maybe you feel touched out. Like there's so many different reasons we can have, you know, a lower sex drive, you know, when you're breastfeeding and you're dry, whatever, all of those things that you go through. But this is such a simple thing that when a lot of women go from like not even doing any kind of strength training, like they'll do walks or runs or whatever. Um, but then they start resistance training. doesn't have to be weights, could be bands, could be body weight, um, there are, there's so much that is going to help you in the sex life department. And also since most women listening to this podcast are in this phase of life with delivery, with postpartum, with actually, again, just living your life so that you don't, um, if your pelvic floor is really strong and it just stops there, you still need the core to be strong to work with it. You need your back to be strong. So if you're putting a kid in a car seat, you're not bearing down on your pelvic floor. So it all goes yeah. together. So I would just say with, you know, being aware now of pelvic floor, if it needs to be weakened or tightened, how you can work on it, trying to start incorporating some strength training too. And you can dabble in that, find what works for you, find what you like, start with what you like. Um, but it is wild how much that can help because a lot of times women say like, I have no energy. I feel like, you know, I'm just dragging. And then especially by the end of the day, I have zero desire to be with my husband because I just feel exhausted. Well, it's going to help your energy. It's going to boost your testosterone and, Um, all those are good things for you and your spouse. That was like a great push to exercise. (laughs) Oh my gosh. We, we focus on it for the wrong reason sometimes instead of like what it does for us. So, yeah. Yeah. You know, if we all changed our opinion of exercise from, okay, I'm exercising to lose weight to I'm exercising. So my sex life can be better. Like how much more motivated would we be to actually exercise? Yeah. Oh my gosh. I maybe want that on a shirt. Maybe. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'd be bold enough to wear it, but maybe a mug. Yeah. Could, maybe a coffee mug. It. That's a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, Brittany, this has been, um, so great. So enlightening. I have learned a ton. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. An additional resource for any of you looking for help with your pelvic floor is Tighten Your Tinkler. Um, I will link 
in the show notes, the podcast episode that I did with Jen of Titan Your Tinkler. Um, but I have partnered with them to offer their um, signature program to you guys, um, which is an incredible program um, for both weak and tight pelvic floors. I have personally used this program. It is incredible. It has helped me so much and I really encourage you to check it out or, um, or check out what Titan Your Tinkler has to offer as well. And if you are not already following us on Instagram, be sure to check us out at charting toward intimacy until next time.